Thank you and thanks a lot for the invitation. It's, it's great to be here today and I will explain to you in two slides why it's great to be here today. Um, so I, um, I am part of the School of Mathematics and Statistics at the University of Melbourne. Uh, but the school is actually quite large and so they created another center called Melbourne Integrative Genomics and basically that includes um, statistician, mathematician, and also some biologists who feel that they do not really belong to their school. We are a bit like outliers because we're very interested in collaborating with other disciplines. And so we created uh, this group, we're nine group leaders, and we um, basically, a lot of our work is um, driven by collaborations. Um, so I uh, actually um, was born in France and I did my PhD at uh, INRA Toulouse, University of Toulouse. Um, so this is where I'm here. And then um, just after I uh, completed my PhD, I moved to Australia. And since then I've been in Australia. And actually uh, I came here and I was presenting in this exact same spot about 12 years ago when I was a PhD student. Um, and I think for me it brings a lot of great memories about, uh, you know, these kind of schools. I think it's, um, it's really, it's a very good forum um, for students. Uh, so a few facts about me. I returned from Antarctica. I spent 21 days on a ship uh, with women with a background in STEM. Um, and so this is part of the Homeward Bound um, Initiative. It's an uh, international initiative to build a cohort of a thousand women across 10 years uh, to be the new leaders of tomorrow. Uh, so leaders in science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and medicine. And I'm just making that call now because uh, we have our applications opening soon for women in STEM -M. And so if you're interested in being part of this initiative and it's, it's hardcore, um, come and talk to me after and I can tell you a bit more about what this program is about. And I apologize for the men here. It's only for women or for people who identify as women. <laughs> um, other thing is I'm also organizing a workshop that is very similar to this workshop, but it will be in Banff in Canada, uh, where we're focusing on developing what are the challenges when we develop methods in working with biological data of multiple types with a specific focus on single cell. And so we gathered quite a lot of data sets uh, on single cell that actually combine different types of omics on the same cells. So I will talk a little bit about this uh, later, but again, um, I'm part of the organization committee and the selection committee. Uh, so if you're interested in this kind of thing, just uh, come and um, talk to me because the deadline is uh, very soon. And uh, to finish, so I've been in Melbourne for three years, um, and it's a great city when the weather is okay. When the weather is not okay, it's not that great, but um, it's been, it has earned the most livable city uh, status for seven years. Uh, great coffee, great food. Um, the University of Melbourne is, and they keep reminding us every day that University of Melbourne is the first university in Australia. Um, and so I have a few, actually one or two uh, postdoc position available in my lab. Um, and so um, with different topics on multiomics. So if, if you're interested in this kind of um, um, yeah, topic, just again, come and talk to me. You can just talk, come and talk to me for anything really. It doesn't matter, it doesn't have to be any of this. Okay, um, so this is where I sit and I feel like, um, yeah, I, I think my talk is gonna be quite different from the other talks. And the reason being is that um, my research is uh, highly um, multidisciplinary. So I work with biologists who eventually come to me and say, hey, uh, I need some quantitative stuff on my data. And then I, I talk to the mathematician in my school and, uh, and they show me all this formula and I'm like, okay, so I'm just going to try to translate from you know, one world to the other so that we can actually answer biological questions. Um, and since I started my PhD, um, I was already working in between those two fields and it became very clear to me that we needed to all work together. 
Um, and the reason being is, um, so, you know, statistician, bioinformatician, mathematician, and biologist. And the reason being is that we have, and you know, we have a lot of data, uh, and they're coming from different sources. Uh, we have a lot of computational issues, so we discussed that uh, in the past few days. And because we, usually the sample size is quite small, it really, uh, it doesn't fit any statistical framework that we have. And so uh, the interpretation of the results is actually very important to make sure we are on the same, um, you know, in, in the right um, direction. And finally, and this is what we're starting to see now with the advent of single cell, is a, it's like a, it's a fast race. And so we have to keep pace, um, you know, making sure uh, that we know all the artifacts of these technologies as well. Um, so when I started, uh, and even before I started, um, we were more in a reductionist type of um, approach where you would have a hypothesis on one gene, and as a statistician, it's quite easy. Someone says, I think that gene is responsible for that disease, and I would be, and the statistician would say, okay, let's do a statistical test, and we're done. Um, but now, because we measure you know, different types of molecules, um, we measure them at once, you know, with high throughput assay, for example. And so the, there's no real biological question. It's, it's very vague, and it makes it really difficult for a statistician to actually work out how, how you can um, answer this kind of question. And so uh, what this slide is about is saying, well, actually, you know, we need to have a, a holistic view of a biological system in order to answer it. But that also means that it's going to shift uh, the way we deal, we see biology. Um, and so um, this is a concept that I think now is quite adopted that, you know, we need to uh, consider different molecules at once uh, in order to understand what's going on, uh, for example, in the cell. And really, there's a need to shift this one gene hypothesis paradigm. Um, and so what I'm going to talk about today is um, how we can do this with multivariate analysis. Um, and I will show you how we can identify you know, a signature or combination of markers. Um, how we can reduce the dimension of the data because they're very complex um, in order to better understand what's going on and uh, also how we can integrate different uh, sources of data. And I'm sure you've seen that before. Um, we know that sentence from uh, George E.P. Box, essentially all models are wrong but they are useful. But it's, we have to put it into context which, where he said all models are approximation. And we need to, you know, born in mind this approximation of our models. This is why I will always advocate to go back to the biology and trying to work out, you know, where, where did we go wrong in our hypothesis, whether it can be a biological hypothesis or, you know, um, a statistical um, assumption or hypothesis. So what I'm going to do is uh, tell you about what do we mean by matrix factorization. Um, and then show you how uh, we can use this uh, to do more either knowledge-driven or data-driven analysis. And then the last part of my talk is going to be on data integration. And so I have to emphasize here because I feel like I'm a bit different from um, a lot of the talks that we had, um, is I approach the problem from a data perspective. Okay, so I start with the data. Um, in order to understand and then refine biological hypothesis, and then uh, in the hope that then we can have a more tractable mathematical modeling approach. So I've been working in, on, in this area for about 10 years, and I'm still not there yet. Uh, okay, so matrix factorization. Um, so I'm going to focus on a specific type of uh, method that are component-based. And a component is basically a combination of variables. So variables can be, you know, gene expression, transcripts, protein abundance. Um, and we, so we build these components to summarize the source of variation in the data. And so the aim is really to reduce uh, the dimension of the data, um, but also to handle, uh, you know, funky distributions that usually do not fit uh, the usual statistical framework. Um, we uh, we make, well, we, we define uh, variation really as the information that there is in the data that we want to extract. Uh, 
And it really helps us to understand, to give, a, to have a, a first understanding of what is in the data, what is the potential, should I go forward with this kind of uh, data? Uh, and so, so you start with a, a data that has, you know, um, a small number of samples, a large number of features or variables, and you would like to end up with just a few set of vectors. Um, so a well-known one is, of course, principal component analysis, and this is a matrix decomposition technique. Um, you can solve PCA with singular value decomposition. So you have your data matrix here, and you, um, you, have, um, you decompose it into a set of um, eigenvectors, the left eigenvectors and the right eigenvectors, and then you have uh, the eigenvalues in the middle. Uh, and so PCA it can be solved that way, and so the, the components, the principal components are actually um, the, you multiply uh, those vectors here that describe all the samples with the eigenvalue here. Um, and so of course, the, so if your matrix is of rank R, you should have you know, R eigenvalues and, uh, sorry, yeah, R eigenvalues and eigenvectors. But in PCA, as you know, um, we don't keep all the, the R uh, components because otherwise you don't reduce the dimension that much. So we would choose a, you know, a, a dimension of PCA that is much smaller than the rank of the matrix. So uh, another thing that you probably know is that um, in PCA, we want to maximize the variance in the data. And so how we do this is, um, what we, in the singular value decomposition, you try to define the optimal uh, weights that are assigned to um, each of your variables. Um, and this combination um, multiplied by the data is going to give you the first component. And the first component should uh, have its variance that is maximized. So this is what we mean by in PCA, we maximize the variance, which is a bit like a vague uh, thing to say, is actually we're saying in PCA, we're trying to find the optimal li um, linear combination of variables so that the variance of this combination is going to be maximized. So the variance of your components is maximized, um, and you can extract it with the eigenvalue. And it's going to decrease. So the first component explains you know, a large amount of variation, and then there's going to be less and less variation. And as a, as a reminder, the variation is the information in the data for us. And the other constraints, and I'm going to explain uh, this also, is that uh, the component should be orthogonal, which means that they shouldn't explain what we've explained already in the past component. And this is how we do um, dimension reduction. <laughs> So, to really, so this is where we're trying to solve. We're trying to find uh, the optimal, um, you know, coefficient weights or coefficient uh, vectors in the variables, so that the, the linear combination is the variance of the linear combination is maximized. So you can write it this as um, as a matrix, um, you know, matrix, uh, yeah, matrix form. Um, and what you need to remember is that those coefficient weights really tell us of how you define those components. So this is the first dimension, okay? So um, you can start that way and say, okay, this is how I want to solve it. This is what the SVD is doing. So when you do a singular value decomposition, it's going to give you all the principal components at once. You know that they're orthogonal, it's all good. But you can also solve the PCA in an iterative way. Um, and so that's not so well known because the SVD is much more efficient. But in our case, um, it's useful to think about it as an iterative method because we're going to apply lasso penalization later on. And so uh, what we do is we start with the original data matrix. So your, your variables can be um, centered and scale, but that's the, the input data. And then uh, to go to the next, to the residual matrix, what you do is you subtract from your original data, you subtract the information you've learned. Okay, so we subtract uh, by reconstructing um, what we've learned by multiplying the component here and the variable, co the loading vector or variable coefficient. And that's going to, we call this a deflation step. Okay, and that really helps you to go orthogonally uh, to the next dimension. So what I mean is that you start 
so you do the first, um, the first step. You um, define your, your uh, loading vector and, your and then you can calculate your component. And then you subtract that information to go to the next dimension that's going to be orthogonal to the first one. Um, so you can write it uh, like this. You want to maximize the variance for the second loading vector so that you have this, um, that your, so that your components are orthogonal. Do you have any questions so far? I would say that in this crowd, you should know about PCA, which is really good because in Australia, no one knows about PCA, so I have to explain it again and again. <laughs> okay, so why do we say we, uh, redu we do uh, dimension reduction? It's because then we can plot those components. So this is component one, component two. They explain you know, a specific amount of uh, variation in the data, and each dot here represents your sample. Um, and then you can look to see whether your samples cluster or, you know, um, yeah, usually people do that just to uh, visualize how similar the samples are to each other based on those linear combination of variables. Um, something I will talk a, a bit more after, but basically um, every value here for a given sample, you have to imagine, you have to remember that it's a linear combination of the variables. So we see that as a projection. So that sample here is projected in a, into a new space that is spanned by the first and the second component. So I'll come back to this uh, a bit later. And yes, so this is what we call in you know, machine learning term unsupervised is you, know, you just plot your dots, your samples here, and you see whether they are similar or not. Um, a lot of people sometimes are confused because they start to color their dots according to biological groups or patient groups. And then they say, yeah, yeah, I can totally see that there is a cluster of samples here. And I say, well, okay, but if you put the same color, would you see the same or, you know, do you think there is really a cluster of samples? So sometimes those uh, graphics can be quite deceptive. But there is more to this because, you know, we, people uh, often who apply PCA just think about those components and say, we plot it, we're done, you know, it's all good. We summarize the variation, it tells us, it's, you know, it, it tells us uh, what is in the data. But uh, we don't really think about those loading vectors. And they really tell us, you know, how important is each gene or each variable to define each component. And so you can really, um, you know, um, extract much more information from this. And so uh, one plot to uh, represent this is a correlation circle plot. Have you heard about this? Who hasn't heard about a correlation circle plot? Oh, you're missing out. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so, so before, when we use a component and we plot them, we project the samples into a new space. But you can also project the variables into the, the space spanned by the components. And so a correlation circle plot is simply uh, to, uh, you calculate the correlation between your original data and each principal component. Uh, so yeah, sorry here, this should be a T for component. And you do that for the first component, so the horizontal one, and the second component, so the vertical component. Um, and you obtain a coordinate. And so this is a gene that has been projected into the, the, the PC space. Uh, and because they are correlation, you shouldn't be outside the big circle. And uh, once you do this, you then know, like if you project your, uh, your gene here on the first component, you know whether you know, it's, um, it contributes a lot or you know, it's associated a lot with the component. Uh, so, for example, if you write in the middle, it's probably not great. But when you start to be close to the large circle, then you can see uh, that, oh, yeah, that, that gene is actually really important uh, to define that component. So I've shown, I've shown that to you for one uh, gene, but you can do that for all the genes you have in the data. So I'll show you what happens. Um, basically, because we are in that correlation circle plot, we can look at the cosine angle between variables. And that's going to tell you how correlated your variables are. So for example, here I have one gene X1 and another gene Y1. Uh, so this is you know, the, the coordinate 
Um, and if I look at the cosine angle here, it's going to be close to 1. And that means that those two variables are positively correlated. And you, know, you can understand that because if you project your variables here on the first component, they're going to end up almost in the same spot. So they probably have a loading weight or a coefficient weight that is very similar because they explain the same thing and they explain this, you know, the variation in the data. Um, if, you do, uh, if you look at the cosine angle between that one and that one, then it's going to be a right angle, and so there's going to be uh, almost you know, zero correlation, close to zero. Uh, so that means that those variables are not correlated. Okay? And uh, you can understand that because if you project that one here, it contributes a lot to define the, the first component, but uh, its value is quite small to define the second component. Whereas the second one here um, you know, contributes a lot to the second component, but not to the first component. And finally, the other, the other case uh, scenario is if you look at the angle between y1 and x2, and your uh, cosine of that angle is going to be uh, close to minus 1, and so that's a negative correlation. So you can imagine now that you have all your genes, and they're going to end up on that plot. And basically, it's a matter of looking at, do I see clusters of variables uh, that end up in the same um, in the, yeah, in the same uh, spot. That means that they are correlated, uh, positively correlated. But if you do start to see opposition, um, then it means that they are going to be negatively correlated. And when there is a right angle, it means that they're explaining completely different things, which you would expect because you know that the components are orthogonal to each other. Um, and so, the, so usually, uh, so what you can do after that is do a biplot. So the biplot is a combination of uh, a sample plot and a correlation circle plot. And so what it tells you is, uh, so from a sample plot, we say, oh, okay, so we have, you know, those, uh, so I call it the dots here. Uh, you know, my, my samples here, uh, they seem to be quite similar, and that's why I see them projected uh, onto that space. What I see from a uh, correlation circle plot, so usually the software will often remove the arrow uh, to your uh, variables just because it becomes quite busy. So here you can say, oh, okay, so those ones, so those genes, for example, are you know, uh, positively correlated. Those genes are positively correlated too. Um, those genes are not correlated at all with those. Okay? So this is a kind of interpretation you, you can have. Uh, but when you combine the two, because you project them into the same space, you project the samples and the variables into the same space, you can overlay those two plots. And this is what you can see here. It's not very visible because we start to have too many data, but you have your samples here, and in red you have your genes. And so that means that, uh, for example, those genes are positively correlated, and because they point towards those, uh, those are cell lines, so they're melanoma cell lines, it probably means that um, they, are, um, they explain those melanoma cell lines. They might be you know, uh, uh, more expressed into the samples compared to the other samples. And so this is where you start to understand you know, what are the relationship between your samples and your variables um, using those plots. Any questions? OK. So now we know uh, what is a component. Uh, we know that the loading vectors are important to tell us how important the variables are to define those components. Um, and so I'm going now to show you different examples of variation of PCA in order to extract some uh, information from the data. So the first method is a pathway-based approach. So what I told you before is that PCA is a linear, uh, assumes that there's a, a linear relationship between the variables. Um, so this is like this. So this is, for example, your first principal component here. Those are your samples that you project on the first component. Um, and basically what you're trying to find in PCA is what is the direction or the principal component that's going, for which the, var the variance is going to be the largest. So it's going to be, go, go through all the data points. But there's another uh, method called principal curves that is not very well known. But you can imagine that this you, here you say, well, this is linear. And is biology linear? Mm, probably not. Uh, so you could actually fit a curve. 
So this is called principal curves. Um, and so the idea is, you know, generalizing PCA for a curve. I don't think it has had, you know, it was proposed in 1989. I don't think it had much uh, uptake. Um, but there was a paper that we saw uh, with a student um, where they use principal curves, but they kind of change it a little bit. So they say, well, okay, so if I project all my samples here on that curve, um, this is going to be a score. So each sample is, uh, is assigned a score, and the score is a here nonlinear combination of genes. Uh, you could define that curve a bit better so that the start of the curve would be defined by um, samples that belong to the reference group or the, um, yeah, the, the normal group. Um, and then project all your, and then, you know, um, yeah, fit your curve uh, through your data points. And so the idea is to say, well, that's cool. So, so every time you project a sample onto that curve, that, cur that sample gets a score, and that score should represent some sort of deregulation score of the combination of genes um, that could be perturbed by the disease. So they proposed this in 2013. Um, and uh, again, I don't think it had much uptake. Um, but I thought the idea was actually uh, quite good. And we could also do that for PCA. It's just that we'd never think about, oh, OK, we should consider this as a score. And then maybe the distance between those score is going to tell us how the disease evolves, you know, or how you, know, how you can explain different disease status. And so um, one of my students, when I was in Brisbane, came to me. So he was working on um, DNA repair pathways in breast cancer. And for one year, he spent his time uh, trying to annotate uh, genes for specific pathways. Um, yeah, so that was a bit painful for him for the first year. So he got a, um, he um, identified 82 genes that he manually created uh, that belong to this homologous recombination uh, pathway. So he said, OK, so I have now I have different uh, DNA repair pathways. I know which genes in each pathway. And he said, well, but in fact, you know, if I look at those genes, those 82 genes, they're not even correlated. So he was looking in the literature. And then when we applied to data, it, there was no correlation. There was nothing. It was really weird. And so we, we decided to apply this pathifier method. And what happens, uh, we think, is that it's a nonlinear problem. And so that's why he couldn't find any correlation or uh, you know, any, any uh, insight uh, in this list of genes. So we looked at four different data sets um, the, from different consortiums. So you have Metabric and TCGA. And then you have different uh, tumor types, so basal, HER2, luminal A, B, and normal. And the number of samples we have is between 22 to 144. Uh, yeah, the maybe 144. So we applied this uh, method. And this is how it looks like in every of those uh, cohorts. So you can see the, the green one is the starting point, the normal samples. And th those are the principal curves that are fitted in 3D. Uh, in, uh, in those data. And you can see that sometimes they're not exactly the same. Okay. Um, and so if you, so once you have your dots, you project them onto that curve, you get the score, and then we just look at the score. And we, this is a simple box plot of those scores. Um, and the normal samples are here, you can see, and that's, uh, that's expected, the, the score of the normal samples is low, because this is the starting point of the principal curve. And then it varies depending on the type of uh, tumor um, subtype that you have. But what was really um, interesting is that we find almost exactly the same trend across you know, different independent data sets. Some were measured on microarray, some were measured on, on um, RNA-seq. So that really suggests that um, his manually created genes are actually you know, good genes to explain uh, the HR pathway. Uh, but it was just a matter of trying to find a method that can actually extract this. Um, and so you can imagine now that um, you, we said it's a personalized score because you could, um, if you did a RNA-seq assay on a single patient, uh, look at the expression levels of those 82 HR genes, calculate the same linear combination that we have here, uh, 
you could tell whether you know that patient is can be you know more likely to be you have a normal like tumor or something like this. So this is where you can really think in terms of okay now we can characterize patients based on the genes that we measure on them. Questions? Uh, I missed how you would get the curve. Yeah, because I didn't explain it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> that's what I explained. Um, so basically, uh, yeah, I have to go back to the paper. Uh, but you, uh, you, I think what you do is you try to find clumps of samples in order the, so that the curve goes through it. Yes. Uh, no, I think it's a bit more uh, yeah, uh, advanced than that. So instead of saying we're just trying to fit the, the straight line to the points, you say, well, I'm actually trying to smooth it. Uh, to go through most of the data points, yeah. I go back to the paper if you want to have a look. Yeah. Just about this, I'm curious if it is the same thing with the different components, you have an eigenbasis. So do you curve and do you get like just relays or do you? Yeah, I don't know if I can. Yeah, I don't know if I can answer that question. I have to look at the paper again. I think um, I think you can, because I think you would have. It's the same as PCA, so you would have you know different uh, spaces as well. We only looked at the first component, principal curve, uh, because that explains. Um, we think it, it's enough to explain what we wanted, but I think yeah, it would be the same. Yeah. No. No, 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 no. It's a, it's a generalization of PCA. Yeah. So you need a parameter for the regularity of the curve? No. It's, it's, uh, it's from the data um, directly. We learn it from the data. You know. OK. You shouldn't ask me any question about principal curves in so long ago, too. <laughs> but, OK. Uh, <laughs> gene modules. OK, so before I show you. Um, how you include knowledge driven into your analysis. Okay, so you start with a set of genes that you think are explaining a pathway, and you use a method like principal curves, but you can use PCA too. The scores represent a sort of dysregulation score of the disease you're looking at. Gene modules uh, are a bit uh, different because you start from the data directly. So we, you, know, you don't start with a set of genes that you're interested in. You just say, I'm taking everything, and I'm just trying to cut it into different modules. Uh, again, <laughs> I'm just going to do a warning now. This is, um, this, this is work in progress. So you can try to ask me some questions, but I may not be able to answer. <laughs> OK, so what are gene modules? A group of genes with similar expression profiles. Um, so what we want is we want to give a global interpretation. Um, and we assume that you know, if we uh, are able to extract you know, a gene module, they must be functionally related or co-regulated. Um, but then you can start to do uh, things that are a bit more fancy. So you have your gene modules, and then maybe you can infer uh, you know, regulatory relationships transcription fact, uh, with uh, transcription factors. Um, and uh, Chloe uh, also explained that, that you can also um, you know, do more, try to improve your, the functional annotation also with this kind of approach. So there's different uh, module detection methods. Uh, a, a basic one would be a clustering of your data, and you just look at the similarity in the expression novels. And so here we're focusing on co-expression. Uh, by clustering um, is actually reorganizing your rows and your columns in your data to try to find some local co-expression behavior. Uh, network inference, so we talk a lot about this um, this week. And matrix decomposition, uh, where you, ex you here, so you extract components. And that's going to tell, you, tell us about um, the different, um, yeah, your dif different gen gene module. So this is what I'm going to focus on today. And so, uh, I, so with my uh, postdoc Alex, we thought that would be he was interested in gene modules, and I say, okay, uh, where do we start? Because they are like all these methods. 
Uh, but what is great, and we talked a lot about you know, the importance of benchmarking for the community. This is a great example of you know, providing a full benchmark on synthetic data. They compare different things and a whole lot of methods of you know, different types. So we've seen, uh, I think with Maria, she talked about the, you know, the CLR data, the Tigress. Anyway, there's a lot of methods. And so Alex came to me and he said, hey, uh, I think uh, we should focus on those ones, the decomposition uh, techniques, because they, they actually uh, behave quite well. They had very good properties. For example, they allow to have genes, the same genes that may belong to different modules. And we thought that would be a bit more reflective on uh, what happens in the biology. I must say I was a bit disappointed because I was hoping that I would have someone in my team finally not doing matrix factorization techniques, uh, but no. So, so um, we looked at, um, so what we wanted to do is look at different cell types in blood uh, using single cell transcriptomics. And we wanted to decompose those data into gene modules. Uh, but you can imagine we're measuring, you know, 20,000 genes. Um, so we would have to trim the modules. So that was our plan. Okay, let's decompose, let's trim. Then let's find this local co-expression um, that may explain subset of uh, those cells. Uh, and then you know, we can do some inference and we can do some interpretation and validation. And you can see this is becoming kind of a gray area because we're still working on it. So um, I was talking about PCA before, then I told you about principal curves. In fact, you know, we do uh, PCA a lot to have a first understanding of the data, but sometimes using PCA might not be the, the best exploratory approach. Uh, and so especially if your, the biological question is not related to the highest variance uh, in the data, so that may happen. Um, I told you that the components are orthogonal to each other, and that's a constraint in PCA. Uh, but maybe there's something past the variance. You know, maybe we should consider higher uh, moments. And so this is what independent component analysis does. It finds, it tries to find the components that are independent of each other. And uh, I show you um, that they are actually non-Gaussian components. And so what the ICA does is that um, it assumes that actually any Gaussian distribution is noise. Okay, so it's not important. And instead, we should separate uh, the signal into noise, no noise, so Gaussian, no, non-Gaussian, uh, while allowing for genes to, um, belonging to, to belong to uh, different components. Okay, so I showed you before, components from PCA are orthogonal. So if one gene uh, contributes heavily to one component, it's unlikely to contribute a lot to the other component. But this is not the case in ICA. You can have this overlap. And you, uh, I'll show you how you can actually detect local and global patterns um, in the data. So the principle is quite similar, except that here you have to transpose the data matrix. So now we have the genes or the variables in columns, and we have the samples in rows. And so um, we have the components, which now correspond to the gene weights. And then we have the, the sample weights or the scores, uh, which were before the loading weight, but I'm just going to call them sample weights. And so what you do is the same. You do a matrix decomposition, but this time you have different matrices. And one, um, and yes, and so um, one is going to tell us more about the, the cells or the samples, and one is going to tell us more about the genes. So what happens in ICA is that if you plot uh, the distribution of that vector here that corresponds to the gene weights, you would, you would like to see a, a super Gaussian distribution. This is not what we have in PCA. In PCA, if you plotted the gene weight, you would see a more Gaussian distribution. And so ICA really tries to find those super Gaussian <coughs> distribution in those loading weights. And then once you have those weights, you can calculate your cells, uh, your samples, components, uh, and then you're done. Okay, so the, the idea is very similar to PCA, just that the, um, the, the optimization criterion are, criteria are different. Uh, so we use a measure of uh, neg entropy. Um, and also what is interesting about ICA is um, 
because we're not trying to explain the variance, you can't, you can't, you don't order the, the components based on the variance. So basically, you look at the L2 norm of those components, and this is how you order them. And once you order those uh, components here, then you find the matching um, samples components too. And the other thing, it's actually a stochastic algorithm, so it's quite unstable. It can, you know, converge to a local optima and things. So. People have worked on consensus ICA or they run ICA many, many times, and then they kind of average the results to have the consensus. So we thought, so the, the original problem was we have, we were interested in looking at single cell RNA-seq data. We were interested in extracting gene modules from single cell RNA-seq. Um, because we wanted to explain better what defines a cell. Uh, because, um, you know, if you work in this area, at the moment, what people are trying to do is to cluster the cells into different cell types. Sometimes they look at the gene, they look at the highly variable gene, but it seems like it's, you know, that's it. We don't, we, you know, we found these different cell types, we're all good. But it would be good now to, you know, push that forward um, and look at gene modules and how can we characterize a specific cell type. Uh, but as you know, the data are very big, uh, so we have a lot of cells and a lot of genes. And then, and this is why I think Alex said, I think we're going to go for ICA. I wanted to do graphical Gaussian models, and he said, no, 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 no. It doesn't work, and you have heaps of zeros, the dropouts. Um, and also, um, those cells are usually not annotated, so we don't even know the ground truth here. So the plan was uh, to modify a little bit the ICA. Um, so we do, um, so we look at, who, so we do a consensus ICA, we extract uh, the gene weights, we order them according to the L2 norm. Once we do that, you reorder the cell components. And this is just a, I think it's, maybe it's a TSN, I hope it's a UMAP plot. Um, this, those are the different cells that are projected into a 2D space, you know, from any method. Um, and then you can, um, you can color your cells, their scores, on that plot. And you can start to see patterns. So for example here, this is an example where you would have the first cell score component that seems to, um, you know, characterize this group of cells here. So uh, those cells here would have a, uh, a score that would be more important uh, in, the, in that component. Whereas here, if you look at maybe at that one, it seems like the, all the cells are colored, more or less. So now we know that uh, you know, this gene weight corresponds to that uh, cell score component here. But instead of looking at all the genes, um, all the coefficients of all the genes, we only look at the extreme weights, okay? Because we think those are the ones that actually define those independent components. And once you do this, um, then you can, you know, you have, basically you have identified your gene module. Uh, the other thing I forgot to say is that at this uh, stage here where we have the cell scores component, you can uh, apply uh, lasso penalization um, in a GLM model, and you start to um, penalize the scores of those cells. So that in the end, you know, you don't have like, you know, a vector of scores. You actually have a sparse, a sparse scores. And so we applied this to these data sets from Tabula Muris. So one great thing about the single cell community is that they share a lot of their data. And so this is an example where you have cells from 20 organs from uh, mice, and they uh, sequence it using two different protocols, so the SmartSeq and 10X. So for example, with SmartSeq, you have about 23,000 genes, 53,000 cells, 18 tissues, 82 cell types. Well, they think there are about 82 cell types. Um, the other data set um, has more, so it's more high throughput in 10x, uh, but to the expense of resolution. So you have 70,000 cells, uh, a bit less number of tissues, and a bit less number of cell types. Uh, so you can have a look here. So this is a UMAP plot of your cells. So it's a dimension reduction technique used in single cell. 
Um, and you can see all your cells and you can color them according to the, cell, the annotated cell type, for example. So we, for, we, we used that data set uh, to see whether ICA could actually extract something uh, from this data. And so we analyzed this data set here, SmartSeq, and the idea was to say, well, do we actually see the same patterns in another data set? So this is, and it's uh, for me, and this is early work still, uh, which is hard to even understand because the data are so big. So here we have um, the different cell types. We have about 82 cell types. And here, those are the different component scores. Um, so here we would have, we extracted 100 components. And um, so, sorry, so if I, if I look at that component here, that component will give you a score for uh, very specific, uh, for every uh, cell type. Okay, so you can start, well, actually, you know, you don't, you don't see anything. I mean, I don't. Uh, but you can see how, you know, each, um, each component is uh, going to be maybe have a, give higher score to a specific cell type, uh, uh, but not to another cell type here, uh, or uh, vice versa, you know, low score, high score. So you, you, there's something in the data, it's just hard to, uh, to see. So I said to Alex, I can't see anything from your heat map. Um, can we do something else? And he said, yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, how about we look at the myeloid cell types? Okay. Uh, so myeloid cell types have different, uh, within myeloid cell types, you have different cell types. And what, you, uh, what he did is that he, he used a, um, on the score, he applied a penalty to put some of the scores, to penalize them to zero, a lasso penalty. And so we then start to see, oh, okay, so uh, for example, that module here, that uh, we call it a component, that component here uh, seems to, you know, be, um, ha give a high score to the brain parasite. Uh, but maybe, uh, oh, actually no, a low negative score to the brain parasite. Whereas if you have a look at another one, this one would give a high score to the non yellowed cell. So you, you start to see to understand how the ICA um, can capture the information from those cell types. Okay. Yes. <laughs> um, you went from quite a few samples in terms of number of cells to cell types. How do you average? Yeah, <laughs> he averaged. Yeah. So you would have, uh, I don't know, we had 50,000 cells or more. Yeah. Uh, but they annotated, so we know that they, we think this is what they are, and so you just average your score across this. Um, yeah, otherwise it would just be a nightmare. And then you look at the, so, okay, so let's say, okay, we're interested in that one, um, that uh, component here, because it seems to explain the brain parasite. Now, let's have a look at the gene module. So let's have a look at the gene weights from the ICA. And that's, so this is what you see here. So this is for a specific module. Um, and those are all the genes uh, that, were, uh, that had a, a very extreme value in their gene weights. And you can see that um, this, uh, uh, for example, in a specific cell type, all those genes are you know, um, expressed uh, with a high expression value. So probably not that interesting for us. But then you can see that for some other um, cell types, uh, the gene seems to be you know, expressed in specific cell types and not in the other. So this is, um, yeah, so I think what I'm trying to show you here is that compared to the principal curve uh, exercise, which was just, we start from a pathway we know, and then we looked at those scores and we say, oh, yeah, you know, it explains disease. When you start from a data-driven perspective where you don't know much, we do know a bit about the cell types, but we know nothing about the genes. It starts to be very complicated. The visualization also starts to be complicated because you imagine here, I'll show you one gene module where we have 100 modules. Um, and so I think what the next steps for us is to try to see how we can make this a bit more systematic in terms of the analysis. But I'll show you what we did, oh yeah, and then so once you have your gene modules, um, then you can do some uh, you know, interesting stuff like we've talked about um, during this week, because you have a, a very uh, much smaller set of genes. You know that they uh, seem to characterize a specific cell type, 
And then you can do, I hope, you, uh, you can do some more inference and look into that. So this is, you know, we, we started to uh, look a bit at uh, transcription factors and so on, but this is work in progress. But this is really to show you uh, the kind of data-driven approach you can have, where basically you have a huge data, you try to remove the noise, try to kind of uh, reorganize the data. Uh, and then um, and then focus on you know much uh, much smaller uh, number of genes and cell types to look at. Uh, and so the the other thing we did is uh, so Dana is actually an undergrad uh, student who was there this summer, and I say okay, so we've done that on SmartSeq, can you do the same on Smart uh, on the 10x data, and tell me if you see anything. Um, and so he he looked at the the 10x. So we have you know we have the the genes here. We took the overlap of the genes. Uh, you, we have more cells, but we have less uh, tissue types and less cell types. And so he did something very uh, quite simple. He um, so he ran the ICA and then he looked at the correlation uh, between those components to see what would happen between the two data sets. So those are the different uh, components um, identified through, uh, on the 10x data in yellow. And those are the SmartSeq data. And you can see, um, and the, so, so the, the edge and the color represent the correlation. But you can see that we start to see um, some consensus um, between those two data sets. Um, so we need to uh, look more into this. Uh, so I said, okay, so this is a kind of a snapshot of, you know, the correlation between the, the two ICA results. Can you do something better for me um, to see, I mean, you know, it doesn't tell us much. I want to know more about um, the scores, for example, of the ICA. Um, so those are the different uh, ICA modules in a specific type of uh, cells called granulocytopoietic. Um, and this is just uh, basically the activation score in each of the, the components um, in either the 10x or the SmartSeq. And you, you start to see that there is, um, you know, some correspondence between the two data sets. So this is a work in progress, um, but it really shows how, you know, how complicated it can be once you, um, when you try to validate a method uh, on different data sets, different protocols, um, and how, how do you approach this on real data? Any questions? Okay, so now we can, I can talk about my favorite topic, which is multi-omics integration. So before I show you, basically I show you how we can use matrix factorization technique to um, yeah, uh, decompose the data into groups of genes, groups of samples, but on, a, on a, the same type of data, okay? So for example, transcriptomics data. Now I'm going to go back one step to show you how we can then uh, do multi-omics data integration with very similar methods. So the OMS, we've talked about omics uh, a lot this week. So you have, you know, um, the collection of all the transcripts, the proteins, metabolites, I'm also very interested in microbiome, and we account this as another omic. Uh, you can have clinical data, you can have a lot of things. And the, so this is what the, the biological dogma uh, tells us. But in fact, we know that it's not, the, uh, it's not true. Um, so for every omic, you have a lot of different types of data. Um, and the relationship is actually not linear. Okay, so you don't go from one to the other. Um, there's actually a lot of crosstalk that happens between those omics. So that makes it actually very difficult from a modeling perspective because we still don't know what's going on. Um, and so uh, the conventional molecular biology, the reductionist type of approach, would look at you know one gene across the samples, do a statistical test, done. Then we started to have the single omics. So this is when we had microarray, RNA-seq, where you would measure you know, uh, thousands of transcripts or thousands of proteins. Um, and we would analyze these omics, usually with a lot of um, statistical tests uh, that we would correct for multiple testing. So this is hypothesis free now, because we don't really know what we're looking for, except that we, we may want to explain disease status. <laughs> 
The martiomics is another, uh, another piece of uh, fish. Um, because we're trying to, uh, there's, I mean, there's so many questions you can, uh, you can have with multiomics, but I, I believe that a lot of people actually don't really formulate it really well. So you might, be able, you might be interested in looking at the correlation within omics, okay? Maybe to try to you know, infer some regulatory network. But you may, you, because you do multiomics, so you've invested a lot of money, uh, you want to also understand what is the relationship between all these different uh, molecular levels. And this is where it starts to be complicated, and I'm sure you know this, because we use different platforms, they're measured on different scales. You know, proteomics have a lot of missing data. For example, RNA-seq don't. Um, and so the, the, whole, um, the whole field is um, still evolving. And so it doesn't mean that you, know, you should completely scratch this or this and just say, I'm going all holistic now. Actually, I believe that the aim of multiomics uh, method is um, to go from a holistic uh, perspective back to a hypothesis generating approach. So basically, my work is to say, I can identify the key molecular features in all, in, on, in all these data so that we can generate new hypotheses and uh, you know, do more validation. So I see the methods I'm going to present to you, for me, are just the first level of uh, exploration. And there's so much more to do after that. Uh, so those are the different types of methods um, that you can use for data integration. And the, the definition of data integration is also very vague. Uh, so we talked a lot about network-based uh, method during this week, but you also have Bayesian approach. Of course, you have the matrix factorization methods. And this is the early days. Multi-step approach is when people would analyze each single omic individually, get a signature of genes, then do the same for the proteins, and then do some sort of overlap with a, you know, a, a good Venn diagram and say, that's it, we're done. So that's also considered as data integration but I'll show you that it's a little bit suboptimal. Okay, so let's go back to PCA, PCA um, version two. Um, so I told you it was, you can solve PCA with a singular value decomposition. In fact, what it means is that you approximate your matrix with a rank L. Okay, so you can, uh, your rank L would be, you multi so uh, because it's a matrix decomposition technique, you can start from the right-hand side and go back to the left-hand side so if you multiply your eigenvalues and eigenvectors, well, you should be able to go back to your original matrix. But of course, um, because you only use L components, then you're going to have a rank L approximation of your original matrix. And so basically, uh, really what PCA does, if you consider the first dimension, is uh, you try to minimize uh, the Frobenius norm of uh, this quantity here, the original data matrix, minus the reconstruction of what you've learned on the data. Um, and so um, when I was starting my PhD, uh, there was a paper out that said, well, actually, now that we are in a least square framework, we can do anything we want now. We can go back into a more regression uh, type of framework and we can do we can apply penalties such as lasso or elastic net or whatever you want. And so the, the aim here is to say, well, now you can penalize the loading vector. You can, because before we have those loading vectors uh, would tell us uh, the coefficients in the component to calculate the component, but you could say, well, actually, you know, there's a lot of genes that actually don't participate in explaining the variance in the data. So how about we just penalize them and we only keep the genes that we think are important to explain the variance in the data. And so this is the idea of uh, sparse PCA. So um, I wasn't interested in single omics. At that time, I was already interested in integrating different omics data, but using similar type of approach. And so I looked at uh, partial least square regression. So PLS is a component-based method, similar to PCA, but this time you have two data sets, they're measured on the same samples, and you, have, uh, you may have p-genes and you may have q-metabolites. Uh, 
And so what you do is you decompose your data matrix again into a set of components. We do call them latent variable. So a set of components and a set of loading vectors. And you do the same for the other data set. But the, the way to integrate the information from the data is to maximize the covariance between linear combination of the metabolites with a linear combination of the genes. So basically what you do is you say, I want to know what are the optimal weights in those linear combinations so that when I combine uh, or I calculate my combinations, the components here associated to the X data set and the components associated to the Y data set are maximally covariant. Um, so we call, um, yeah, so those, uh, yeah, this is what I said, we have the PLS component. So this is how you go basically from PCA to PLS. And then I worked out that actually you could solve PLS with single value decomposition. So that's quite um, convenient. Um, so you have basically, you do the same, you're trying to minimize the Frobenius norm, but this time of the cross product X transpose Y, which is of size, the, number, the P times Q. And then it was only one step to go to the sparse version of it. So one, because now you fit into a least square uh, framework, then you can penalize those loading vectors, okay? Because I was interested in variable selection. And so basically what you do is you apply a penalty on the loading vectors um, associated to the X data set and another penalty for the Y data set. And then you have this multi or mixed signature so that they are maximally covariant or correlated between the two data sets. Any questions? We haven't, uh, we haven't coded elastic net. Uh, so it's, we actually solve lasso with soft thresholding. Um, and so it's, it's an approximation of lasso. So we don't fit, you know, in the constraint of the lasso where you can only select a certain number of albums and so on. Um, a lot of people come to me and say, you know, I'm concerned because my variables are correlated. Does that mean that I'm not going to select correlated variables? You do select correlated variables within the same data set, but also between the data set because the self soft thresholding is much more lenient. So you don't have, I feel, I feel that we don't have, you know, um, we're not limited by this type of penalty. And we're still able to uh, extract correlated features. Uh, just one thing also is um, PLS by nature is very appropriate for correlated variables. So I won't uh, explain uh, the algorithm, but basically what you do is, it's you trying to fit a um, multivariate regression where you have Y as a matrix. So you do Y equal X beta, and X is also a matrix, okay? So this is untractable. Um, but instead of doing this, what we do is we, and this is why it's called partial least square regression, is you fit a, um, a regression uh, using the components as an intermediate. So basically you're saying that component here actually is summarizing my X data set. So you do the regression using that component instead of doing this matrix matrix. Um, and so that works uh, really well for big data and for correlated data too. And also there's no uh, assumption on the distribution uh, of the data. No, and this is what is really good about uh, PLS, is because you decompose your matrix into a set of vectors, um, you project, so those components is actually a projection of your samples into the space spanned by the components, okay? So this data set lives into that space. And that data set lives into another space because they're metabolites. But because you maximize the covariance between those components, it's almost like you, um, you move the space so that they actually agree. So I think this is, uh, th for me, this is a, a good uh, definition of data integration is to say, I do not constrain my data to all be the same on the same scale. They allow to live in their own space, but I, I, you know, the components are defined so that you, you extract the same information. <laughs> 
other question? Okay, so that was only my first um, uh, story with PLS. And then uh, I went on to, you know, more variation of it. So one was, uh, instead of having, because uh, what I showed you before were unsupervised analysis, okay, so you had two data sets. I didn't say anything about the samples. But you can actually include uh, information about your samples. Okay, so you can do a supervised analysis where you say, well, actually, you know, I have uh, sick people and non-sick people, and you can. So you can actually. Uh, so that's the idea of the PLS discriminant analysis, where um, instead of uh, having a data set here that was the metabolite before, I just have an outcome vector. But the trick is to transform this outcome vector into a dummy matrix. Okay, so if you have three classes, your uh, matrix Y here is going to be transformed into a matrix with three columns, and each column is gonna say, are you in class one, yes or no? Are you in class two, yes or no? Are you in class three, yes or no? And then that's it. So that's how PLSDA uh, was proposed, and it works really well. Um, and so uh, some of the work that I did later on was to do the sparse version of it, where you would select um, the, or you would penalize your, the loading vectors to select the genes that explain your outcome. Okay, so it was, I wouldn't say it was straightforward, but yeah, the idea is straightforward. And then after that, you can go even more crazy, and so this is where we're like, woohoo, let's do the multi-omics now. Uh, so we have, imagine you have at least three data sets, you can have even more. But you also have the outcome, and, we, and so basically the idea is the same. You decompose your data matrix, but the, the integration happens because you maximize the covariance between the components between all these data sets. So in terms of formula, you can write it like this. You maximize the sum of the covariance of linear combination of one data set with a linear combination of another data set. And uh, we um, put here a, um, we call it a design matrix, but basically it's, um, it's a value that tells us whether do you want to maximize that co covariance, you sure, or you, know, you don't need to. And so that um, method is called regularized canonical correlation analysis. Um, and so you, there's a sparse version, there's also an elastic net version. Uh, and yes, and if you have, a, if you have an outcome, yeah, by all means, put it in and then um, basically change uh, one of the data, data sets as a dummy matrix. Uh, and so in the end, you have a set of component scores per data set. Um, and those component scores should be highly correlated between your data sets. Um, and if you do a supervised analysis also, then you have combinations of subsets of discriminative features. Um, so this, uh, of course, that, that sounds well in practice, okay, so it's like, yeah, of course, yeah, why, why did we wait so long for to do this? Well, because actually it's not that easy. Um, so there's different parameters. I haven't told you anything about the parameters so far, but you have to um, tune the lasso parameters. You have to decide the number of components you want, okay, so this is the same as in PCA. And then, uh, so this is the lasso components, and then the, the design matrix, which is, you know, I told you, it decides uh, whether you want to maximize the covariance between data sets. So I'll show you a bit about the design matrix. Actually, we have, um, well, we have a few tricks to, to choose a design matrix. We, we prefer that it's actually driven by the, the biology. Uh, so this is a design where you have your three data sets, you have your outcome, and this is what we call a full design. So you just say, oh, I'm going to put a one in front of the covariance, uh, you know, in front of the covariance term. So just go back here. Just, yeah, so that term here. Do you want to put a one, a zero, or in, the, in, in between? Um, so yeah, you can say, I want all my data sets to be highly correlated as well as explain the outcome of interest. Or, uh, no, actually, you know what? Um, I think what is really important for me is to maximize the discrimination between the sample groups. Remember still that um, there's some integration going on in, the, in that method, uh, but it's not gonna be the primary aim of the method. 
Or you could say, well, actually, so-so. So, you know, I think there's a bit of correlation between those data sets, uh, but the actually explaining the outcome is, seems to be the best in this data. Uh, what I would like to say is that it's a highly constrained model in the sense that, uh, and I still can't really explain it theoretically, um, but if you uh, focus on discrimination, it's hard to focus as well on correlation. Okay, so a, a model like this uh, is, is going to struggle because you're trying to both maximize the correlation and the discrimination. And so there's a... Um, it seems to be uh, we need to reach a sort of compromise. Uh, there's just too many uh, constraints. Number of variables, that's a tricky one. Um, so we use cross-validation. In this case, we're in supervised framework, so we can use cross-validation, repeated cross-validation. And that's just to, to uh, give you an idea of how complicated and combinatorial it can be. Um, so this is the error rate um, of the, the method, the model. If you select a combination of 20 mRNA, 20 microRNA, 15 CPG, and 15 protein, okay? So it tells you our error rate is about, I don't know, so 30%. And then you test every possible option. Um, and so this is the first component. And once you find what is the best, I don't know, I can't even see, probably around here, then you move to the second component because it's, uh, it's solved iteratively. I showed you before how you could solve PCA iteratively. Um, you can do the same with this kind of, with PLS. So then you go to the second component, you look at the error rate for all these combinations, and you say, oh yeah, I should select those ones, and so on. So that helps you to uh, decide how many components you want because the more components you add, the more you're going to explain in the data. But at some stage, you kind of stall. You know, there's no, nothing more to explain, so you have to say, okay, I'm cutting here because I really want to reduce the dimension of my data, so there's no point going forward. Um, and then it also tells you how many, uh, how many genes, how many microRNA should be in your signature. Uh, and so we use that with self-thresholding. That's why we don't have that, you know, the, too much constraint on, with the lasso. Um, the other thing I, I should say is um, because we use soft thresholding as a, to solve the lasso, we don't uh, tune the lasso parameter. We can directly tune the number of variables we want to select. There's a, um, there's a correspondence between the two. And then you have the sample visualization because I told you you do matrix decomposition into components and then you can plot those components per data set. And then you can start to see, you know, is there any agreement uh, between those data sets once I apply this method, once I select uh, those variables. Um, and then you can look at the signature. Uh, so this is the correlation plot from before. But um, every uh, symbol here represents a type of variable. Okay, so it can be a metabolite or protein or a gene. And because we maximize the covariance, uh, you can overlay. Basically, it's as if you're overlaying different uh, correlation circle plot from different data sets and you put them all in front of each other. And this is where you start to, to understand what could be the correlation structure between your data sets and between your variables. Um, and then uh, we designed this, uh, we call it a circus plot, and it's, um, it's quite similar. I mean, for me, it's quite similar. Uh, so you have the mRNA name here that was selected. Uh, here you have proteins and microRNA, and then you have a link um, between um, the different uh, variables that were selected that are highly correlated, either positively or negatively. I mean, for me, I see this, and I already can tell you what's going on, but I think uh, some biologists prefer to see yeah, something a bit different than the correlation so correct. Um, and, you know, I was, I was telling you about gene modules before, but it's the same here. Um, so you can extract uh, groups of variables that way, and then you can represent it, you know, in a network visualization. Here we looked at different type of approach. Concatenation is a very naive way where you just concatenate all your data. You have a very, very fat matrix, and then you apply whatever method you want. You know, it can be PLSDA or anything. And sample, as I told you, is you run a, an, uh, an analysis on 
um, individual data sets, and then you kind of say, okay, now I have a signature of genes, a signature of proteins, and a signature of metabolites. Let's see how correlated they are. Uh, and this is our approach. And so you can see that um, you know, the, it's, the, the connection is much uh, higher. So every dot here represents a type of variable, and the color represents a type of variable, and the dot represents a, a variable that has been selected. So you can see, and this is because you know, this kind of approach is designed to maximize the covariance or the correlation between your two data sets. So of course, it will be connected. Whereas this one is more like, it just ha it seems to happen by chance. You know, we just analyze all these data sets individually, and yes, of course, there is some correlation between them. Um, this one is a bit, um, what we found, I don't know if you can see here, is um, one data set often wins. So for example, RNA-seq usually has quite a lot of clear signal, and so that creates, uh, it tends to be more select, the RNA uh, transcripts may tend to be more selected than other um, types of variables. So this is why I think it's not a good idea to just put everything in the same basket. You actually need to respect the fact that they're on different scales and they have, you know, they have different levels of noise and different complexity. So we coded a lot of those methods into Mixomics, which is an R package, and this is just, a, just to show you how, what it does. So we talked about those methods. Uh, we talked about the PLS. We talked about the multiomics. There's another approach where we, uh, very similar to what you um, talked about, Chloe, about um, combining independent uh, data sets on the same features. Uh, those data sets may come from you know, independent studies. And we use a very similar idea of projecting your data into another space so that we don't have to deal too much with the batch effect or the study effect uh, between those studies. And because they're all component-based, then you have you know, all the sample plots. They all almost the same, um, it's just that you know, the, the question is different. So you have a biological question, and based on the biological question, you're going to um, select the method you want, basically. So this is what I try to advocate when you use this kind of toolkit, is to say, what is your biological question? And based on your biological question, this is the kind of method you should apply. Uh, and then we, uh, what we did is we ran, since 2014, we ran a lot of workshops to try to educate biologists to use these kind of tools because you can imagine it's, that it's quite complicated uh, for a lot of them. Uh, okay, so I have five minutes to show you uh, that it works really well. <laughs> no, actually, I don't know. <laughs> so we looked at the first week of human life. Um, we have babies and we take a very small amount of blood, less than one milliliter of, milliliter of blood uh, in those kids. Um, and then, uh, what, uh, so this is a, with a, a team in Canada and then they looked at you know, the transcriptomics, the proteomics, a lot of different data sets. So we have a very small cohort, there's only 30 newborns. Um, but because they've been measured at different time points and so on, that makes quite a, um, well, it's some result is, you know, okay. Um, and we call it the small big study, small, because you take such a small amount of blood, and it's amazing that it could actually do this. Uh, and the big, because then we have all these data sets. And uh, what is great about these data sets is we have a training set, but we also had a validation set. I must say the validation set wasn't there in the first, submission of the paper. Uh, and then he came back and they're like, oh, you should validate. Yes, of course we should validate. Mm -hmm. and so another year of experiments before we could validate. Um, and so what we found is before, uh, what we, we thought is that in the first week of life, um, the, everything was, is random. So what people, researchers thought is like, oh yeah, it just makes a human and they grow, but it's kind of random. But we found that it was actually very ordered. Um, and so this is the, the number of transcripts that are differentially expressed across time. So you have, uh, I mean, the time points is very small. So you have um, day one, day three, and day seven. And so this is just uh, the number of transcripts that are differentially expressed between day one, day three, uh, but, uh, compared to, uh, sorry, there's day zero. So compared to day zero, um, how many transcripts are expressed, whether they are overexpressed or underexpressed. And you can see that across time, things start to kind of kick off. 
Um, but then they say, okay, so they did a classical, uh, you know, ensemble type of analysis, and then they say, okay, we have all these lists of transcripts, proteins, metabolites, let's do a network. Um, so this is your network. <laughs> and I say, okay, uh, where do we do this now? And uh, so, uh, okay, uh, let's try something else then. Uh, how about, you know, we analyze each data set, each layer of data individually, have a look at the correlation between them, do some sort of network visualization. I say, okay, it's the same, and you can't see much because, yeah, there's, there's too much stuff there. And so they say, okay, well, okay, let's uh, do a Diablo then. I say, yes, that sounds okay. Uh, so we did the integration, and so what we find is because this, um, this method really decomposes the signal into modules, uh, then you can start to see stuff happening. I'm not saying you should you know, just use Diablo. There are other methods that we tested. Um, and what we found is that um, they, there's some new insight that you can get from integrating omics uh, data. And you also find pathways that are common where whichever method you use. And so basically, I think that's the take home message from this paper is to say, you know, you should apply different methods and, um, and, see, and see what you have. And don't focus only on the common stuff. There's methods that are very good at extracting something specific from the data. Uh, I'm going to, oh no, I wanted to talk about this. Uh, so this is an example, just to show you how you can generalize this through a pathway-based analysis that I was uh, talking about uh, before. So this is where you have uh, an example of uh, data sets with three data sets, and your outcome is a pre-post um, challenge for asthmatic uh, patients. Um, and so because uh, we had 15,000 mRNA, uh, we had quite a few metabolites. Um, what, so this is work with Emrit, who is in Canada. He said, oh, you know what? I think I'm going to summarize them into pathways. So OK. Uh, so he summarized his genes into gene, non-gene pathways. Um, and so you have much less. And the way he summarizes it is very similar to the PCA or the principal curve analysis I showed you before. They just basically it's just um, com combining genes within the pathways into a score. And he did the same also for the metabolites. And you can see how you can be quite creative depending on the question you have. So for example, if you say, okay, um, I'm interested in specific gene pathways because you know, that's really what my question is about. I don't care, I think the metabolites, I have no idea what's going on. And so you could um, integrate you know, specific gene pathways to work out what are the metabolites that are you know, um, heavily um, correlated uh, with this specific pathway. So you can really uh, start to cut your data into different bits and summarize them into different ways depending on your biological question. Okay, what's next? Uh, lots. Um, we're working on single cell now, and we have new protocols to do epigenomics and transcriptomics assays on the same cells. Uh, so you can have RNA-seq, and then you, have, um, you can do the DNA methylation, accessibility, terrible data, zeros everywhere, missing values, complicated. This is what we're doing. Uh, so um, there's an example of a, a data set that is available, and it's also available in our hackathon in Banff. And we started where we have a um, different stage of uh, gastrulation in mice, um, and then it corresponds to different lineage as well. And so we started to run Diablo because um, Diablo is a PLS-based method, so you do partial least square regressions, which means that you can handle missing values as well, because it doesn't matter if you're missing one data point, you're trying to fit those regressions. So this is uh, what we're doing. It's still a small data set. There's only 800 cells, and that's because um, yeah, the, the technique, the protocol is actually quite hard, but this is what we're going to do in the next three years. Uh, so yes, yeah, so I just want to say uh, I work a lot with biologists now where I design my own data with the biologists and I say, can you please do it that way? Um, and then my team focuses more on the analysis, methods development and so on, and then, uh, and then we discuss with the biologists about the results. Uh, I'm going to uh, skip this, but uh, we're also uh, uh, w uh, looking at time course including multiomics and microbiomes. So this is something that you can do now. You can measure all the different microorganisms in a, 
in a, in a biological system. And then you can look at the transcripts, you can look at the proteins of the microbiome, of the host. I mean, it's, yeah, it's data bonanza here. And again, the data are horrible, but you can, you have, um, because it's easy to sample the microbiome, depending where you're looking at, but let's say fecal samples, very easy, very, quite cheap. So you can have time course uh, where you can measure across, across very long periods of time. And I think uh, the data is still quite complex, um, but there's a lot of potential for um, methods development there. So this is my conclusion. I decided not to put any words except my website. Um, so what I'm interested in is how do we, how can we actually have a holistic analysis of this kind of data, starting with data. Okay, so we generate multiomics on a specific um, biological system. We do a, some data mining to try to work out what are the key molecules that seem to explain that system. And this is where we are now in my team, but what I'm really interested in is to look at the modeling aspect. So now that we refine uh, you know, our search to only a few markers, can we do more modeling there? And once we do the modeling, can we then do more in situ validation? So here I gave you an example with uh, microorganism because it seems a bit less complicated for me to, to do in situ. But you have to remember that it's, uh, it's not a linear path and you have to go back and forth and you know, discuss uh, with the biologists to work out, you know, is the hypothesis okay, is the results okay? And, mm -hmm. But this is really how I envision um, this field uh, to go now. And I think that's it. So I wanted to thank um, the Mixomics team, um, people who have been in my lab or are still in my lab. Um, there's a lot, I collaborate with a lot of uh, people and they can come from biomedical field as well as you know, more fundamental uh, biology. And I also wanted to thank INRIA because they actually paid for my flight from Australia. <laughs> thank you.